I have been living, eating and sleeping alone for six months. There is nothing old about this city and yet here I am, afraid of ghosts. I found Millie after eight lonely weeks or 168 solitary meal times, in a quiet moment of serendipity or perhaps divine intervention that meant nothing at the time and now means everything. I hope you've had a scrumptious day. Tonight, I'm eating cheese ramen from my favorite restaurant. Millie has a lot of favorite restaurants, but I phone this one all the same. My order follows hers exactly. One large bowl of cheese ramen with a soft boiled egg and a side of beef rice. I have been a vegetarian all my life, but Millie wouldn't like that. Mmm, it smells good. She is wearing a yellow bow today, presumably to complement the cheese. This tells me that she has planned her dinner with some foresight, which, besides her company, is more than I can say for myself. But my niggling sense of inadequacy is eased away by her first mouthfuls, the steaming soup, the moan she makes when it passes her lips. Whoops, she says, laughing as a noodle trails against her chin. My mouth waters in anticipation. Like everything that changes you, Millie made caves of my assumption and calls for re-evaluation. If someone else had been in my position when she pulled me from the pit, I might have laughed or made a face like Millie did when she ate a plate full of lemons. It's so good to see you. How's your day been? There is a pause in which I answer, it's been okay. I mean, it's better now. Thank you so much for stopping by. You know I always do. How's your day been, Millie? Let's eat ramen. There's always a slight disconnect in our conversations, but I have grown used to it and find that similar disconnects exist in my daily life. Since Millie, I have learned to appreciate these gaps as profound moments of intimacy, the space where minds can meet. And I would venture my relationships have improved as a result. It could be the excitement or perhaps the knowledge that soon my body will be full, but I need the bathroom. Millie freezes with a spoon hovering over parted lips, her little pink tongue just visible. I try not to go to the bathroom too many times because it spoils the flow of our conversation. Millie doesn't like spoiled things. Once she made a bowl of cereal and the milk came out in large quivering clumps. Millie screwed up her face, but she still looked perfect like that, like a little wincing doll. It's disgusting, she said, but looking back, if you mute the sound, avoid the expulsion, the words still look pretty falling from her lips. When I lock the bathroom door, I think of my mother. Sometimes I lock it quietly, so the metal barely makes a sound and I can pretend it isn't happening. Sometimes I lock it loud with a flick of the wrist, quickly and with purpose. The door I know needs to be locked today and I accept it. Sometimes I do it without thinking and these times are the worst. A numb realization washes over me when I try the handle and realize what I've done. I don't think she noticed me locking the door before I moved away. Or if she did, she thought nothing of it. I think that's part of the problem. It put distance between us that she could not breach without breaking it down. And I am not sure which of us it isolated. The door was frosted glass, so I knew I could get out if it came to that, but I hoped it wouldn't. There would have been nothing left to break. When I was at university, a friend of mine liked playing the imagine if game. Imagine if your mother drove, drove over and took you out for lunch, she would say. Yes, I would reply, imagine that. Imagine if you came home for dinner one night and there was nothing to eat but soap, imagine that. Imagine if all the toothbrushes came to life and became very malicious and started swearing, would people still put them in their mouths? Imagine that. Imagine if you locked the bathroom door and stayed inside for two whole days until your mother called the police. Imagine that. 
My friend says I don't understand the game very well. When mother did come to visit, she banged hard on the bathroom door. If I think about it now, I can see the shape of her body in the glass. But she is already a spectre, here from another time, travelled all this way to haunt me. Perhaps she did notice me locking the door after all. My doorbell rings and I spring into action. The elevator pings seven times, counting the floors. And even though it is a logical impossibility, I hope it will be Millie waiting for me when the doors open. I have tried to smile like she does a few times and I practice now in the mirror, but my face has none of her warmth and I am suddenly aware of my skeleton. The delivery man is loitering outside, checking his watch. I apologize as he hands me the bag. It doesn't matter, he says. I hope you weren't waiting for long. I'm having dinner with a friend, you see. The restaurant sends its compliments. It's a pretty night, don't you think? You can almost see the stars over the city's spectral haze. I notice the moon is shaded yellow, so I add, as Millie might, the moon looks like a giant bowl of ramen. The man looks at me suspiciously and, thanking me again, disappears on his bike. I return to the lift and let the scent fill it up like steam in a sauna. I had similar conversational success during a phone call that happened with my mother last Tuesday. Hello, mother, I said to the air. Her voice arrived back and I thought about how far we can reach without actually touching. She said, hello, hello, darling. And then she asked how I am. Luckily, I was prepared. I have practiced my answer with a giant smile every night for four months. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Millie always cares when she asks how I am, so I would never disappoint her with the truth. My mother was well. She had decided to open a little shop in the village. That's nice, I said. I think there's something very sad about, about her hypothetically small shop, but I didn't tell her that. The shop is pretty in my head, the kind of place I would like to go myself but she looks wrong dressed in black among the pastel pinks and blues. I wonder what she'll sell. I wonder if she'll still buy me birthday presents or if she'll just pluck one off the shelf. I wonder if I'll like it anyway. Maybe Millie and I will visit when it opens, I said, but I know that's ridiculous. I have no plans to go home. My mother said that would be nice, but I don't really know Millie. It upsets me when she says this because Although four months isn't long, I feel like I know her quite well. Do you love her? She said. She's my best friend. Do you love me? You're my mother. Imagine if I forgot to lock the door and she tried the handle. Imagine that. Imagine if she moved too fast and slipped on soap and hit her head. Imagine that. Imagine if the insistent water forced her throat and found her lungs. Imagine that, imagine that. Maybe you could sell soap in the shop, I said. It's a coincidence, really, because that night, Millie told me she was opening a shop too. It's online, so you can visit wherever you are. She has always been so thoughtful. I don't think her shop will be anything like my mother's. If it sells soap, maybe it will smell of her. I don't think that's out of the question. Mother said she was going to visit soon, so it would be nice to have a few Millie bars on hand. When I return to my flat, ramen in hand, I am comforted by the glow from my laptop, which is, which is gathering quietly in the darkness. The walk from the front door to the light switch, however short, always fills me with dread. You're home from a long day at work, says a familiar voice. Hi, Millie, I say placing the hot plastic bag onto the table. Her voice is sweet and I feel it stirring my cells. You are very special, well done. I am suddenly filled with a deep uncertainty. I look closely at my laptop on the table. You're here, I say. It's so nice of you to drop by and see me. It's my home, I have to drop by. 
Grab your food and get comfy. I'll get you a bowl too, I say. But she is already eating. I walk to the kitchen, leaving her behind me. In my mind, I search for her shadow. Would you like a drink? I love soup, she says. I empty a tin of tomato soup into a mug and place it in the microwave. I realize too late that it is decorated with her face. It turns smiling pirouettes in the blistering heat. And I am reminded of the day I moved away when it was hot and disorientating and I had no one. I return and place the soup in front of her. She is paler than I remember, like her skin is made of porcelain. She has two red bows in her hair and as she crouches over her dinner, she looks feline, predatory almost. All she needs are whiskers and she could be a beckoning cat. She looks at me then. I feel it pierce my heart. She has always been so familiar. Won't you come home, she says. Won't you please? I am home. I can smell something strong like eggs, but I can't see what she's eating. Please visit my shop. I will. I unwrap my food and break apart the wooden chopsticks. I can use them as weapons if it comes to that. With hot mouths that taste the same, she is so close that we are almost touching. When it is done, I place the containers back in the bag. It is like they were never there and the thought of them arriving so recently and then being disposed of makes me want to cry. I want to cry, I say. I don't like that, she replies. I stand up and walk to the bathroom. Her face screws up as she watches me go, like it is full of lemons. I close the door, flick the lock. Only then do I realize that my mouth is swollen with soup. I spit it into the sink, but it has burned through my cheeks and they are red. What are you doing? Comes a voice from outside. I turn to the door just in time to see a silhouette advancing towards the frosted glass. Thank you.